you. So, the, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Irina for this, uh, actually, this opportunity to, to exchange in a particularly puzzling moment. Uh, and uh, and share with you the, the impression I got yesterday from uh, from the discussion, and this this was that um, coming from uh, from Portugal, my country, and the uh, ongoing uh, political developments in my country uh, appeared as some kind of anomaly. Uh, in in what sense? In the sense that uh, we have a socialist party scoring uh, in the opinion polls about 40%. Uh, the parties on the left scoring about uh, 17 percent, so heading up, and it's and we can add up at least in this uh, moment, those scores. This amounts to almost 60 percent. So a country where the left is uh, scoring 60 percent, and uh, having increased in the last three years from uh, much less, is uh, appears to be some kind of uh, anomaly. Adding to that the fact that uh, we don't really have, uh, apparently, uh, an extreme right uh, which uh, constitutes a threat at the moment. So, this is, uh, <laughs> but before, before I go into, into comments on, um, on the prospects of this experience, let's call it this way, I would like to share with you some uh, some other points on um, on the uh, on our current uh, predicaments in uh, in Europe and elsewhere. So, I, being an, an historian of economic thought, I'm very much the the slave of uh, of dead economists. So, and there are um, there are two dead economists, great economists, which I would like to evoke here to try to 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 make sense of uh, what is going on. Uh, the first one, uh, surprisingly, uh, is uh, Frederick Hayek. So Hayek, uh, Hayek has a paper in 39 where he advocates uh, federalism. Federalism at, as, a, as a means both uh, to promote peace, and this uh, was shared uh, across the political spectrum in Europe, across a broad, uh, across a broad uh, number of uh, political families, uh, and also, and this is specific to Hayek, as a means uh, to promote the liberal order. The second one is, uh, has already been evoked here quite, quite justly, which is, is, is Karl Polanyi. But let me start by let me start by by Eck. So and, and the uh, and if we go back to the um, to the to the to the, uh, to the uh, if we go back to the war and uh, Second World War and the, the immediate uh, aftermath, uh, we find that uh, economic and political integration uh, actually arose in Europe um, as the only available antidote to the repetition of the, of the, uh, of the tragedy. And uh, in, this, uh, in, this, um, in the discussions around this theme, I act together with other uh, fellow neoliberals, they advocated for um, federalism. The, it, it was unspecified. Uh, the, the, scope of, the geographical scope of the federation was unspecified, but I think it's fair to say that uh, Hayek had, had mostly Europe in mind. For him, political uh, and economic integration should be thought, uh, as I just said, not only as a safeguard for peace, but as a context providing conditions for the flourishing, in these are his terms, of a, of a liberal order. Economic uh, integration, he thought, the free flow of commodities <laughs> and capitals, not so much of people within the Federation, would preclude what he called then planning. Uh, and he meant by planning what we would mean by public policies in general. So this concept of planning was actually very broad. Uh, it would constrain the capacity of national governments to pursue independent economic and social policies, and it would restrict the possibilities of collective actions by trade unions, uh, for instance. According to Hayek, 
the transference of the lost political power by national governments to the scale of the federation, which, by the way, was advocated uh, by what I might call socialist uh, federalists and other socialists like uh, Myrdal, so integration with the transference of the political powers lost by the national governments to the scale of the federation, was to be feared and uh, counteracted. But nonetheless, and this is an important point, it, point, he believed that planning at the scale of the federation, that this transference of power from the national governments to the federation in general was unlikely due, due to the fact that the federation itself was diverse from the institutional point of view and from the point of view of levels of development across nations. And this diversity would uh, preclude consensus on what he called, uh, or what he thought, he deemed uh, market constraining public policies. But this, at the same time, did not mean for Hayek that the Federation would be deprived of power. On the contrary, the Federation would have the negative power to do away with impediments to the free flows of commodities and capitals, but it would lack what he called the positive power of meddling with the market mechanisms and uh, engaging in, uh, in public policies um, geared toward uh, social, the achievement of social goals. So the Federation would have market-enhancing cap capabilities, while at the same time would lack market-embedding ones. The expansion of markets and of market type relations in society, unconstrained by polix, politics, law, or ethics, uh, dreamed by Hayek, was interpreted, on the other hand, by <coughs> Polanyi. And it's interesting to bear in mind that uh, Polanyi and Hayek uh, shared uh, Vienna, Austria, as, a, as an intellectual. Uh, seen, uh, so the, there was an exchange actually, w was interpreted by Polanyi, as you know, as the dystopic pursuit of a market society, a, a pursuit that was in fact endeavored in the 19th century, especially under the gold standard, leading to crisis, uh, fascism, and war. A major teaching of Polanyi, among others that uh, were also already recalled yesterday, uh, a major teaching of Polanyi's great transformation for our time is in fact that people detached from communities uh, left uh, defenseless in face of the vagaries of expansive markets tend to seek security wherever they find it on offer. All attempts at unleashing markets, disembedding them, put in motion counter-movements seeking self-protection. More importantly for, for us now is the idea that these counter-movements are politically indeterminate. Their real nature is usually at the outset, as he said, vague and ambiguous. They, these counter-movements emerge in uh, variegated forms. We can recognize their most pernicious symptoms from, symptom, from uh, signs which are at the outset not clear. Uh, let, let me quote uh, Polanyi on uh, those signs. He wrote, uh, the spread of irrationalistic philosophies, racialistic aesthetics, anti-capitalistic uh, demagogy, heterodox currency views, criticism of the party system, widespread disparagement of the regime, or whatever was the name given to the existing democratic setup. Now, uh, Hayek and Polanyi were uh, fundamentally, in my view, fundamentally flawed in important uh, respects. Neither the economic and financial integration under globalization 
nor the European integration process tend to secure peace. We cannot be sure about this. They may indeed, on the contrary, unleash instability and conflict within and among nations leading to disintegration. Nor, on the other end, the end of laissez-faire announced by Polanyi's great transformation has proven to be irreversible. But they were also right in other respects. Economic and financial integration, as uh, Hayek pointed out, does constrain political policies aimed at embedding markets at the national and at the, federational, at, the, at the federation scale to a point where markets come to rule over politics. The Polanyi, on the other hand, was right <coughs> while thinking that the unleashing of markets has put in motion uh, or may put in motion cultural and political processes that may degenerate into authoritarianism, factionalism, and racism. So in this slide, in this slide at least uh, and, uh, for me, the crisis of uh, social democracy is really no mystery. It is the crisis of uh, centrist political movement which has embarked in the globalist and federalist impulse of the 1980s, only to discover that in the process it was giving away the capability to materialize its political program, either at the national or the international scales, as Hayek had predicted, and exposing the working classes to the vagaries of markets and alienating them to demagogues offering protection as anticipated by Polanyi. Of course, the EU uh, uh, does not translate precisely Hayek's blueprint for, for the Federation, but it uh, resembles it to, to a great extent. Uh, more than the EU, the Eurozone resembles it uh, much more. and. Uh, with this, I would go to the, the experience of a peripheral country within the EU and the Eurozone. And I'm aware that the case of uh, Portugal is presently often presented uh, uh, as an illustration of the possibilities of the left, even within uh, what I call the federation. And this is the point I would like to, to, to engage on now. What is this experience uh, showing? First of all, after a period in the 80s and the 90s where EU membership uh, secured for, uh, for Portugal and other accession countries like Spain and Greece uh, considerable growth, uh, the country has experienced under the euro um, a decade, uh, what was a decade of stagnation first, which was followed by a deep uh, recession. Um, while the euro membership secured uh, abundant capital and uh, low interest rates stemming from the banking system of central eurozone countries, this abundance of capital has translated on the the one hand in growing indebtedness in the national banking system and on the other hand on household mortgage for housing acquisition by families, uh, credit both for investment abroad uh, of the Portuguese uh, group, lar larger groups and uh, uh, funds for, for investment in sectors sheltered from external competition and low contribution for the current account balance. In 2008, the Portuguese banks cut off from capital flows, were cut off from capital flows, and uh, in fact became insolvent 
and uh, a burden for public finances that the Treasury could not bear. And this entailed, uh, as you know, uh, collapse in 2011, a crisis which was a debt crisis, but as we know, emphatically not a public debt crisis. <coughs> and it entailed a bailout by the IMF, the EU and the ECB, which addressed it as a public debt crisis by austerity and uh, internal devaluation, um, shattering uh, the foundations of the Portuguese society and putting in motion a cumulative process of, uh, which has different expressions, but uh, at least the two main expressions is uh, stagnated real uh, wages and uh, demographic decline, which still is going on and uh, with which we are presently struggling. In fact, what, uh, what happened was that the DCB and the EU chose to bail out uh, the core European banks exposed to peripheral debt by shifting the whole burden of adjustment to the citizens in, uh, of Southern Europe. And the consequence for Portugal was uh, a so-called adjustment that lasted until 2014 with a cost of 6% in GDP. I know my Greek colleague is uh, listening <laughs> and, uh, and I know that 6% in GDP can hardly compare with 25% of GDP, which uh, with a cost of um, almost uh, uh, 400,000 jobs half a million emigrants in a population of 10 million, a twofold increase in uh, public debt. So the, uh, the first point is that the, the bailout was, uh, and the consequences of the bailout was resisted by uh, a popular movement, I think we can, uh, we can call it. And this popular movement took uh, two different, uh, two different uh, manifested in two different ways. On the one hand, it was, it was a pro protest movement, a version of Indignados in, uh, in Portugal, maybe with a lesser e extent than the one experienced in uh, Spain. And on the other end, a political uh, manifestation, which was the expression of um, a longing for more than a longing for uh, a demand from the popular movement to the left-wing forces to unite, basically, and to stop the process that was, uh, that was going on. So, as a result of this, uh, of this uh, resistance to the, uh, the so-called adjustment, uh, in the elections in 2015, there was um, there was um, there was a right wing. The right wing party once again had a, the relative majority, but there was um, a situation where uh, heading up the uh, the elected the elected uh, members of parliament of the left wing forces, including the Socialist Party, the Bloc Esquerda, and the Communist Party a majority was possible to, to achieve. And this, uh, this uh, actually happened in the form of uh, the constitution of a socialist government with the support of uh, the other left-wing forces in terms of, uh, of an agreement uh, written on paper under uh, some basic uh, very basic and very minimum uh, requirements for uh, for collective action of uh, the left wing uh, forces. So, from the point of view uh, of the Socialist Party uh, and uh, what the Socialist Party has been uh, has tried to achieve was, um, in fact, the, the squaring of a circle uh, by combining the alleviation of austerity on the one hand, mainly through 
the reversal of cuts in pensions and wages of public servants, and on the other end, fiscal consolidation, meeting the targets of the EU Stability and Growth Pact. So far, uh, thanks to favorable external context, which is overall a context of uh, recovery and growth uh, in the EU and elsewhere, uh, this squaring of the, the, the circle uh, has been possible. And I have to confess to the surprise of many, including uh, myself. And uh, it, uh, it has been possible with the positive consequences, both for the economy and uh, for the majority of the, the population. Hence, the uh, good results on the polls. Uh, we will have elections uh, in uh, 2000, uh, by September next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know uh, there's still a long time to, we have still a long time <laughs> until September 19, but uh, the possibility of uh, having this uh, uh, almost 60% uh, result in the elections of the heading up to the left is achievable. However, tensions are uh, resurfacing. Uh, so fiscal consolidation combined with the burden of debt, the debt is there, the debt is still there, it's 125% of GDP, and the fragile banking sector that keeps on absorbing large amounts of the public fund of public funds is uh, in fact uh, precluding uh, the recovery of the capacity lost mostly in the public provision of health but also <coughs> transportation and uh, infrastructure wages remain stagnated and the changes in labor, labor law, which were um, enacted during the Troika's bailout, have not been uh, reversed. Emigration, emigration with an E, not an I, and demographic decay has not been contained. We keep on losing population. Uh, and this, uh, in the case of Portugal, amounts to uh, the depopulation of a large part of the territory. I know in Serbia <laughs> something similar is taking place. So a number of uh, present, uh, presently a number of uh, uh, questions arise. And the main question, I think, for the left in Portugal is uh, the following. Uh, to what extent will, uh, favorable, will the favorable external conditions replicate in the near future. We have been experienced to a two and a half percent GDP growth. Prospects for the following years are, are not the, the same. So can the squaring of the circle to which the Socialist Party remains committed to be achieved in less favorable conditions, meaning uh, slower growth, and uh, higher interest, interest rates, which will finally happen. So can the Socialist Party and the other uh, political forces on the left achieve a common platform in these new, less favorable conditions after the new elections in 2019? Can, uh, is the Portuguese experience really showing that uh, within uh, the Euro framework there is room for um, social democracy and left-wing policies? Is there really room within the Eurozone to to the uh, to this uh, to a left-wing uh, program, 
uh, my answer is, uh, my personal answer is uh, probably not. And, uh, and, this, um, and this, is, uh, this is a point that uh, we, very, we very often avoid to, to discuss <coughs> because we are aware of the fact that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard point to discuss. But I believe uh, that this is a discussion that we, uh, we should, uh, should really have in common and sh we should have in common in particular with our, with our comrades from, uh, from Greece and Spain. Uh, the euro question is one that should be openly addressed uh, presently. Thank you. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Great. Uh, okay, can you hear me, Renis? Yes, of course. I okay, can so I don't know if you see me, it doesn't matter, you don't need to see me, it's not important, but I'm a cherry. So just, just a word of introduction, of course, you are speaking from Athens, mm -hmm. and you are a researcher at the Center for Political Research at the Pantheon University of Athens. So I didn't say your, your, your surname, it's Ioannis Valampanidis. So you're going to talk about, I understand, about a combination of European uh, country of the, countries of the South, uh, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and France, in relation to, again, uh, European integration and economic crisis. But I think you'll be putting in your paper the emphasis on the, on the Greek case study. Okay? So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I hope you, you can hear me and see me. Yes. <laughs> uh, let me first of all uh, thank the Institute of Social Science for the kind of invitation and also present our policies because I uh, forced myself and kept us in Athens. Uh, but I will just compensate by my virtual presence there. Okay? So I move forward with, with my with our paper, with our presentation, uh, which has a title the competitive symbiosis of social democracy and radical left in Europe and Praxis, uh, and focuses uh, on, on Southern Europe where the economic crisis has uh, its more dire effects. Uh, of course, uh, in Southern Europe where the interaction between social democracy and radical left has been quite significant. Hmm? During the period of crisis, uh, their financial and political crisis converged with a twofold effect of dominant and European. Social protest proliferated, culminated in an electoral and elected government epidemic, as we know from the literature, and the use of challenging parties in Mets or all kinds of groups from them. Especially the radical left has proved to be a challenging political force which moved from pariah to participate of the political system, acquired electoral visibility and became a threat to the mainstream center left. And now it was the social democracy that was facing the dilemma of innovation and resignation. But despite the fact that the literature on social democracy is extensive and the approaches on radical left are proliferating, there is an absence of studies focusing specifically on their interaction with since 2008-2009 has been significant. So in this paper, we propose to examine the two happy families, not on an individual basis, but from a relational perspective, in a number of case studies. And those case studies, the two of them concern of course countries of the European periphery that comes on the insubjective fiscal stabilization programs, that is Greece and Portugal. But also examined are the case of Spain, which was treated with an informal reorganization plan and faced crisis in crisis, or some scandals and the question, the question of Catalan independence. And also France, which saw its hegemonic role in Europe contracting, and is experiencing an international like crisis giving rise to the far right. The aim here is to examine the effective social democratic radical left parties. And different ways in which they respond to the practice of practices in this country and the disruption of the electoral context, as well as the investigative of their strategic reorientations, complicated conditions, convergence, or move to 
by families that are bad. In this context, we will regard this part that as rational contributors who are neighbors on the left of the scale and which adopt office policy and own policy acts and make attempts to gain personal government effects. And furthermore, we take into account the diversity of political dichotomies, such in Portugal and economic left side and welfare economic liberalism dimension, which was at the state center of the political debate. Which in Greece, the uh, pro European euro skeptic component has been particularly special. In Spain, a complicated set of regional political treatments and corruption scandals have defined political frauds. While in France, the public debate is defined by the economic, cultural, and cosmopolitanism versus sovereign conflict. The story is one well, Dual economic political crisis and the emergence of new challenges have destabilized the big parties and systems, in which the part of Kuwait's radical land and socialism has been part of the two key pillars since the transition to democracy in recent Portugal since 1981 because of the ranking class. Social democracy was in power when the crisis hit. In Greece, we had Papadero government, in Spain, Tapatero, Portugal, and Socrates, uh, which had to part of the AD Mets and Bayland parties, which in Portugal, or by the regional state bank of Spain. On the other hand, the radical left, mainly adopting a popular discourse, took advantage of this window of opportunity, participated in whole party to social protest, like his many in Greece, in others, in Spain and presented itself as a new political actor against the political elite, and in particular against socialist initiated the Australian Church. Then the well-established and equal elections which didn't play was part of our cut. The decline of social democracy's votes there and the perspective eyes of radical left brought the two players on a more equal footing. One could wonder if this shift in electoral perspective to serve as the first step of the present in the two. Especially radical left by politically representing social protest, leading enough strength, political and electoral, but like coalition potential is the social enemy partners, the Portugal and eventually in Spain governmental operation. Or even to directly threat to extend them as dominant parts on the left side of the spectrum, that was the case of the trans, with Melanson, or even to succeed in doing so, emerging as a major governing power, which was the exceptional case of Greece uh, and Syria. In the cases of Greece and France, this unequal relationship was just reversed. Big socialist party in just took apart in 2012, while its vote along with the French party member moved to Syria, and that's for the French so what if they move to the elections. And it seems that the debate of social democracy does not lead to a convergence, as we see in Greece or in France, but especially when the social democracy shrinks the radical strengths, the equalization of the electoral appeal is the way to tackle convergence, as it is in Spain Portugal. And now, having in mind this plot twist in the electoral competition, let me now briefly focus on the political and ideological responses of parties to this external sort of the crisis as factor of convergence or support divergence. <coughs> Beginning with radical left, the key for its advance is precisely that it stressed its anti systemic fight against the mainstream party office, especially the left parties, a strong populist rhetoric was advocated. Flexible enough to sense of the dominant austerity policies and the political elites, most often considered to be corrupted, and also a stance oscillating between soft and hard for your skepticism, such was the case of Syria's hypothetical plan B to the lenders, or even Melanson's plan B of a possible return to the front. Indeed, this new political style <coughs> clearly prevailed against older, more moderate forms of radical left politics. For example, the Tsipras generation versus the more moderate series uh, Old Guard in the elite of series of Greece, uh, like Podex versus East Eta Comitra, the more traditional Euro communist 
left part of Spain, and of course, made a subversion to the party from the East. And in this way, radical left sees the issue from, from social democracy, but nevertheless, as radical left votes their rights, it can close to more reactive positions, mitigating the artistic Eurosceptic profile. Thus, radical left was unable to vote for its popular and austerity transition, but I think that within narrow margins, permitted by the complex and conservative institutional entity that is the European Union, at least in so far as it is used to adhere to half your scale. The pragmatic shift of compromise of Syriza has been the most striking example of this, uh, but the limits of the radical threat were also to be by Odefos and Bill to achieve the Paso of the socialists in the context of a national crisis that was the crisis of Catalonia. The reorientation of the radical left was facilitated by the emergence of a new generation and type of leadership. Uh, as we know, the personalization of politics which is a trend dating before the crisis, and now appears additional to be complemented by rather loose organization structures, as we see in the case of Syriza, of Podemos, of France and Sunnis, which were not to be found in more traditional participatory parties like the Izquierda Unida or the French Communist Party. That enabled uh, the new leaders, like Tsipras, to steer the seat from protest to government with greater determination and flexibility. So these factors play a dual role in what concerns your argument. In the beginning, the competitive relations between the two families is escalated, as the minor planet player gains in strength and the dominant part is established. But afterwards, the distance in their ideological profile and strategic choices they choose. Major strategic mutation of radical left was that from policy seeking, as that from policy seeking to an interest in governance, an increasingly intense office and the vote seeking character, rather than entrenching behind its strong protect part of life, which was the choice of radical left in 2000, they now confronted the question of power. And with the exception of Mike Masson, who remains constantly a big party socialist, it is no coincidence that other forces of the radical left pragmatically seek instant or maintain. Ways of cooperation or cohabitation for the social family at national and or European level. It is indicative that even an Orthodox party like the Communist like Party of Portugal would be more pragmatic, downplaying an identity issue like a bureaucratic in order to support in a way the socialist government. Moreover, in Spain, we need Podemos after having operated with Sanchez, perhaps in accord on the grounds of corruption, called the parliamentary support for PESO as minority government, and especially on issues like the 2019 budget or the high symbolic report of ranks and remains of the value of the Poland. In the exceptional Greek case, following the signing of the memorandum, Syriza has developed a different strategy. On the one hand, denouncing social democracy, especially at the national level, the Greek set left. The other, it flexed with it, especially at the European level, participating as an observer at the meetings of the European Social Democrats. Now, moving on to social democracy, to social democratic parties, this new electoral equity group has created the various internal sources. Social democracy finding itself threatened by its enemy brother for the first time since the fall of the Berlin Wall, seems to break with previous strategic path in order to remain relevant, relevant to the Wall, and maintain its government potential. After the strategic defeat in managing the crisis, social democrats attempt a programmatic shift towards the left, defending welfare state and proposed economic liberalism. However, they keep supporting several policies of planetary reform, and thus their convergence from neoliberal economics the adoption of third wave policies came to an end, however, without marking a clear effect as the identity crisis continues. As far as Spain is concerned, for example, from 2015 onwards, a polarization of the economic left right to the right there, with PSOE having moved to the left and being closely associated with democratic renewal, criticizing corruption, and client. In Portugal, since 2012, socialist MPs tend to vote more frequently against the Coelho government's draft legislation, 
And from 2013 onward, the positions of social democrats and the radical left MPs coincided on issues like state budget. And it was Anton Opta who told to break the social tradition of not negotiating with the left and told the government back by block and to this party. And still, the social party in Portugal for all its propriety. After Costa pronounces a vigorous skepticism of the EU's economic and fiscal regime. So, after the electoral rise of the radical left, the question was posed how could social democracy retain political hegemony in alliance with right wing party? In Greece, for example, there was a Patsoka Neodemocratia coalition government until 2014, or its same base had this end up stepped on. An investiture vote in order for Partido Popular to become government in 2016. However, several social democratic parties took out collaborate with right wing parties, supporting them in various ways, in order either to remain relevant political forces, such examples are the fact of a no confidence against pet pains and pet in 2017, the rejection motion against the right wing government in Portugal in 2015. Or to maintain a coalition potential, as is the case in Greece, where the fragmented center left around SOC seeks to come move the away from its strategic collusion with the right, though it keeps clear distances from Syriza too. <coughs> and it is no coincidence, uh, coincidence that uh, in most cases there has been fragmentation or even split at the leadership level and or in organizational forms. Uh, the leadership crisis in PSOE, the collapse of the PS in France, the changes of leadership and alliance experimentation in Greece. For example, Pandreou was forced to align with Neo Democrat in 2011. His success of Venezuela's deepened this collaboration in the period 2012 2014. But now, Sophie from 2015 onwards, acknowledged that this collaboration was more detrimental than beneficial for Paso. Without, however, the clear distance from an eventual new government coalition with Nea Democratia in the near future. So, to get the long story short, the critical juncture of the crisis has modified the quasi frozen dynamic between radical left and social democracy, at least the European side. Nevertheless, there is no clear answer to the question of whether the crisis has brought those parties closer together or moved them further up. Hence, the term we use, competing the symbiosis, seems to be an appropriate term to describe the antinomies of these perennial fluid reasons. There is a double movement that works in a seemingly paradoxical way. First step, it seems that the aim to be strategic brief. In essence, however, the established ideological identities and pilates put in forward critical situation. Radical left takes advantage of weak opportunity of the crisis, so as to represent the radicalism through anti systemic populism, through an anti state agenda, and a radical soft field of skepticism. And it is thus strengthened and expected social democracy. But soon the radical promise is its limit, and the radical left, then from the test government, adopted a more pragmatic stance, indicate its anti systemic philosophy for five is in the alliance with the Social Democrats at the national level, Portugal, Spain, or in the anti European level, like Cyprus, that is that. With the only exception here being well and shown in opposition to a more modern left party communist in France. On the other hand, Social Democracy, after the shock of its further debilitation due to United States crisis management, takes the previous strategic paths so as to maintain the relevant political force. And to maintain its government tensor. It is criticized the E and the fiscal policy, that is the case in Portugal, partly espousing the anti state agenda of the radical left and just causing them a front against the right, also in the anti corruption, that is the case especially in Spain, or is an entirely right response, which leads to its pacification, like in Greece or in France. Certainly, these displacements caused by the practices and the electoral government epidemic in the European South cannot be considered as a generalized norm of the two-party families as a whole. 
אני דרך כמובן את מסתכלת ואולי מתקפל לבואי הקטן, ובכל מקרה היא תיקי את הבואי הגברה את הפרדייסט, בדיוק יצאו, ואיזון פרום אבסולט סטביליטי, שטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקטקט
And now political landscape is divided between two, two camps, right-wing populists uh, who are able to recruit voters among uh, people from rural areas, uh, people who are not well educated, um, uh, who come from uh, a lower middle class and working class. And on the other hand, we have the liberal camp represented by conservative liberal uh, parties, uh, which uh, are able to recruit uh, well-educated people from the big, from bigger at the biggest cities uh, of Poland. Uh, so I think that so that's why I think that Poland is very interesting and and uh, and can be the good point. Uh, uh, of start to discuss the challenges for the progressive movements uh, in uh, Europe. But I would like to start uh, with the short, uh, uh, short history of the left uh, uh, in Poland after uh, the collapse of communism. And I would like to start with... Which picture do you need? Uh, Kwaśniewski Mil. Mil, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, okay. great. Okay, and I would like to start with the uh, main uh, left-wing party, which uh, was founded during the last, uh, in the break, during the break of the last Congress of uh, Communist Party in uh, January uh, 1990, uh, when uh, the group of reformists uh, within the Communist Party decided to establish the new Social Democratic uh, Party, and. There are two leaders, uh, two founders of this party. This picture comes from the first Congress in January 1990, and uh, and and this picture was made in uh, 2003 during the Congress of Social Democratic Party. The guy on the right uh, is Alexander Kwaśniewski, former president of Poland, and then he was the president of Poland. And on the left, Leszek Miller, prime minister. Uh, Prime Minister uh, of the um, uh, Social Democratic uh, Government. And they were founders uh, of the Social Democratic Party in January 1990. And it was, and, uh, it was very interesting because uh, Kwaśniewski was the chairman and Leszek Miller was the general secretary of the party uh, responsible for uh, organizational issues, but it was, it was it was uh, very interesting how they uh, divide the obligation uh, duties uh, because Kwaśniewski was responsible uh, for contacts with new democratic elites, with uh, business, with liberal circles, and Hiller was uh, was responsible for contacts with the uh, with the uh, post-communist voters, with the uh, former members of Communist Party, former members of military of the police traditional uh, core electorate of, uh, of post-communist post uh, social, social democracy. And the name was, uh, the name is the Democratic Left Alliance, and uh, this party has twice formed uh, governments as uh, the dominant uh, coalition uh, partner. And uh, the 1993-1997 term was won by the alliance due to social discontent, discontent caused by the free market shock therapy. Radical economic reforms had led to the closure of many industrial plants and a sharp increase in unemployment in the country. Moreover, the alliance also benefited from the new election leg legislation, which was favorable to large parties. The political right, in turn, was split into small parties, most of which didn't make it into parliament. The alliance slowed down the neoliberal reforms, but didn't implement a significant paradigm shift in terms of Poland's social and economic development. The political left's greatest success of the term was to adopt Poland's new de and democratic constitution, which was widely supported in the national referendum. The second government, formed by the uh, post-communist Social Democrats, was in power from uh, 2001 <laughs> to 2005. The term of office was largely devoted to the preparation for Poland's accession to the European Union. The accession turned out to be the highlight of the government's activities. Also, at the time, uh, at the, time the alliance was beset by corruption scandals. 
Inspired by the ideology of the so-called third way, the party's leader and Prime Minister Leszek Miller, on the left, uh, shifted the party towards the center right. The decision was made to support the war in Iraq and deploy uh, po Polish troops. Taxes for businesses were lowered and Miller introduced a plan to implement a low linear personal income tax. And I would like to quote uh, Leszek Miller uh, because I think that this sentence uh, uh, in the best way uh, describes uh, the neoliberal shift of, of uh, post-communist social democrats. Leszek Miller, generating national wealth and its redistribution are to a large extent separate spheres. The first <coughs> is decided by the hard and objective laws of economics and the market and the, sec and the second by social justice. Policies must have a liberal character because the market can only fulfill its potential in conditions of a free economy. The problems of society must not be placed on the market, nor should ideology be an in, in, impediment for the free market. Economic growth will be quicker through low taxes, a low budget deficit, and better management of budget resources. And uh, this term of, of the, this, this uh, period of, uh, of uh, post-communist uh, government uh, finished with the electoral uh, collapse defeat because in 2001 uh, uh, the party uh, got 40% and uh, in general elections uh, 2005 uh, the party got only 10%. So they lost 30% of, of support. And uh, I would like to focus on the, on the uh, reasons of the crisis uh, of the post-communist social democracy. And the first is change to the distribution of, of social and political cleavages. Because contrary to Western Europe, parties in Central and Eastern Europe do not represent socio-political cleavages in the sense described by Lipset and Rokan. We may therefore distinct, distinguish uh, three types of cleavages, cleavages in post-communist countries. The first, the territorial and cultural cleavage, uh, rural versus urban, traditionalist versus modernizers. Uh, the, post -communist, the second, the post-communist cleavage, anti-communist uh, versus person associated with the previous system state institutions or people nostalgic for the social security of, offered during communism. And the third, the socio-economic cleavage. Uh, so this is the classic left, left, uh, left, right, uh, left, right cleavage. And after the 1989, the Polish political scene was structured mostly by the first two types of social and political divisions. The main criteria for the electoral decisions of Poles were the evaluation of the period of so-called real socialism and they approach to certain cultural issues, uh, especially uh, the political role of the Catholic Church uh, in the public life, the right to abortion, some moral issues, and European integration. And uh, post-communist uh, post social democrats was able to win thanks to its ability to mobilize voters who had been the part of the state structures before 1989, former members of the Communist Party, military and police, uh, police staff, and so on, as well as those who felt nostalgic about the social security offered by the socialist period and who didn't uh, benefit from the country's systemic transformation. On the other hand, uh, left-wing politicians were able to attract a large proportion of the electorate by emphasizing their competence consensus building abilities and the uh, recruitance to become involved in ideological disputes uh, coupled with secularism and pro-European attitude and openness uh, to the world. And prior to the successful elections uh, of uh, 90, uh, 1993 and 2001, uh, Social Democrats presents, presented the, the party as a predictable moderate and competent alternative to the heavily ideological divided and decrepit political, um, uh, political right. A similar message sent to the voters in 2007, however, did not yield the expected results. The, leads, the leaders of the post-communist political left 
didn't realize that after the defeat of, in 2005, the modernist position in accordance with the cultural division had been taken over by civic platform. This is the main uh, liberal conservative party uh, member of the European uh, People's Party. Uh, by civic platform led by Donald Tusk, the uh, president of uh, European Union Council. Uh, now, the platform was perceived by voters as a more attractive and more re reliable uh, alternative to the right wing and populist law and justice party. Law and justice this is a ruling right wing populist party. Uh, civic platform was able to attract part of, uh, of uh, left traditional electorate especially uh, those who had voted uh, for the uh, post-communist social democrats for historical uh, reasons. And uh, the, the, the post-communist social democratic party proved unable to develop its new political identity, an identity aimed at breaking through the dominance of the two right-wing uh, parties. And uh, the other uh, source of the crisis, identity crisis, uh, in my opinion, is combined with the origins uh, of the of the uh, post-communist uh, social democracy, because uh, we may distingu distinguish four paths leading to the formation of the left-wing parties in Central uh, and Eastern Europe after '89. The first parties, which arose from the former communist parties, but which have abandoned communist ideology and uh, rhetoric, adopting a social democratic approach instead and which have uh, cut their ties with the former system. And this is the case of Poland, and this is the case of Hungary, for example. Uh, the second parties which arose from the former ruling parties, but which have retained the communist ideology and symbolism, and this is the case of uh, Czech Republic and uh, communist party of, uh, of uh, Bohemia and Moravia. And the third group, uh, is a parties which were created as a result of the rebirth of social democratic parties that had existed in Europe prior to the arrival of communism in CEE countries, and this is the case of Czech Social Democrats. And uh, the fourth group, newly formed parties, uh, it's for example, Labour Union, the small social democratic union in Poland. Uh, and the Elites and leaders, uh, and only in the Czech Republic did a revived historic social democratic party become the dominant political party of the left. In the remaining countries of the region, the monopoly on the left was scooped by, uh, by social democratic parties arising from the former communist parties. And the elites and leaders of these parties came mostly from the technocratic and pragmatic members of the former Communist Party. They didn't have any problems accepting a free market e economy or parliamentary de democracy. Their adoption of social democratic identity was not a result of uh, thorough ideological debates. Rather, it was a form of seeking legitimization and adaptation to the new political reality. And I would like to quote the chairman of the post-communist social democrats uh, in 1996. Uh, uh, he said something like that during the uh, party meeting. In fact, the allegation that our party has shifted away from ideology is not justified at all. We have made a conscious decision not to be an ideological party, to be non-ideological, pragmatic social democrats striving for success. We want to make use of the opportunities presented to us, and we want to be an election-ready party. And, uh, and of course, uh, of course, this uh, this uh, this project uh, collapsed uh, in a. 2000, uh, 2015, during last general elections, and uh, this party was not able to enter the, the parliament. But uh, before, uh, the, before the last general elections, the new party uh, was established in Poland, new le leftist party, which is called uh, Razem, Together Party in English. And uh, it was the party uh, formed by uh, activists, former activists of, of Green Party and Young Socialist Association, a radical left independent, uh, independent uh, association. 
and uh, this party received uh, uh, three uh, percent of the vote and um, and did not enter parliament but uh, the result gives the party the right to receive a contribution from the state budget and an opportunity to sustain itself and develop further uh, and uh, of course, the appearance of the racism uh, on country's political stage caused varied reactions among the observers. Right-wing and liberal commentators uh, described the party as a neo-communist, leftist, radicals, and Marxists. In turn, marginal rep representatives of revolutionary left-wing criticized the party as a reformist and social democrat. But uh, the party politicians described it as a social democratic party. At the same time, they dissociate themselves from post-communist social democracy. Uh, and they are also emphasized their links uh, with Podemos or Syriza or other new, uh, new left-wing uh, parties. And I have to... Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, this one. And uh, this party has a, t a traditional uh, social democratic social economic agenda, which uh, appears radical after three decades of neoliberal hegemony and the ideological surrender of the third way, new uh, social democrats. Political radicalism is a notion which is characterized by relativism of time and space. It's clear that a pro-social program for correcting the neoliberal pulse of capitalism currently appears to be radical in Poland. In conclusion, we may claim that uh, Razem Party is a new radical left, as its program is positioned where the social democratic movement traditionally used to be. And uh, this is this is this is the uh, the uh, Razem Party. But uh, a month ago, we had uh, local elections in Poland, and and uh, which uh, brought uh, bad news for the left in Poland because. Uh, Post-communist social democrats uh, got only six percent, and the Razem Party uh, got uh, one uh, one percent. And of course, the, 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 this is the challenge: uh, uh, how to break the uh, hegemony of two um, of two uh, uh, right-wing parties, liberals, uh, liberal one, and and right uh, and uh, populist uh, uh, one. And last uh, last sentence, because. Uh, because uh, in February, uh, it's, it's announced that in February we'll have the new party, new progressive party, and this is uh, Robert Biedron, uh, the first uh, former uh, member of parliament and former mayor of Słupsk, middle-sized uh, uh, town uh, in Poland, and he was the uh, he was the found in the 90s. He was the founder of. Uh, association uh, campaign against homophobia and, and he's the first and in my opinion the only open gay politician uh, on the Polish political scene and now he's one of the most popular uh, politician uh, in Poland and the first polls uh, give uh, his non-existing non party 10% uh, and uh, and 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 uh, and many, many, many experts uh, think that he's able to, uh, to recruit voters from uh, both groups, uh, cosmopolitan voters because of uh, his cultural agenda, but also uh, communitarian voters because uh, he comes from a very small town in the eastern part uh, of Poland and uh, he, uh, uh, he has very progressive uh, opinions in economic uh, fields and uh, he underlines uh, the interests of rural areas and post-industrial areas uh, in, in, uh, in Poland. And probably, but uh, the, the most important thing is that uh, he avoids uh, using the term the left. And, and, and he said that, 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 his, that his project is beyond the left and right, and we'll see, but, uh, but maybe it will be a receipt uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for the progressive movement, for the leftist movement, uh, how, to, how to break the hegemony of the, uh, of the two uh, right-wing uh, camps. Thank you, and very sorry. To